I'm going to just jump right in. Alexander Wilder, Madame Blavatsky, and American Platonism. On a day when the Philosophical Research Society Library was closed to visitors, in his office, Manley P. Hall was assembling philosophical delicacies for his lectures, books, and journal. I was his research assistant, but I had reached a dead end. Even he knew very little about Alexander Wilder. That's surprising because as an elected official, Wilder helped end Boss Tweed's corrupt reign over New York City. As a physician, Wilder pioneered what would become known as holistic medicine. As a social activist, he was an early feminist, publishing Plea for the Liberal Education of Women in 1884. As a book editor, he helped Madame Blavatsky complete Isis Unveiled. As a journalist, he worked to end slavery. Any one of these achievements could have made him historically notable. It all began when I encountered a big leather bound volume inside the library vault, where my job gave me access to a collection of alchemical manuscripts and esoteric rarities. To my surprise, it contained issues of a newspaper called The Platonist. I gently turned the fragile pages, finding translations of Neoplatonists, but also several of the earliest American essays on Sufi beliefs and even the work of the French occultist Oliphas Levi, translated by Abner Doubleday, a retired general who fired the first shot in defense of Fort Sumter at the beginning of the American Civil War. Later, Doubleday became vice president of the Theosophical Society. In 1907, the Mills Commission declared that he had invented the game of baseball, though historians beg to differ. Strange enough that any newspaper should be devoted to this kind of content, but even stranger that it was published in St. Louis, Missouri in 1881, the year of the gunfight at the OK Corral. Cattle drives continued, but St. Louis was becoming notorious for smog caused by coal burning factories. In the shadow of industrial smoke over the prairie, how in the world, I wondered, and why in the world had this newspaper come to exist in such an inhospitable time and place? In Bibliotheca Platonica, a slightly later publication from which the occult was banished, I found the report of a celebration of Plato's birthday by a club of mostly women. Dialogues were discussed and poems recited. The mysterious Alexander Wilder presented a paper in absentia that was well received. As Kathy Gutierrez wrote in Plato's Ghost, her study of the influence of Platonism on American spiritualism, quote, reports of Plato clubs were serialized in the Atlantic Monthly. Magazines wrote multi-volume accounts titled Plato in History, and the Yale Review kept readers current on new translations. In 1869, the New Englander sported a densely packed 32 page, quote, defense, unquote, of Plato as a proto monotheist. And in the same year, a pamphlet titled The Eclectic Philosophy was circulated, which endeavors to explain the entire history of Neoplatonism, beginning oddly several centuries before Plato. From vaunted literary minds to the conspiracy <laughs> theorists of their day, Americans were awash in Platonic and Neoplatonic writings and thought, unquote. The author of that eclectic pamphlet was Alexander Wilder. Wilder was a co-founder of the Platonist and Bibliotheca Platonica, but the editor and publisher whose own translations were at the heart of the project was Thomas Moore Johnson, the sage of Osceola, also known as the Missouri Platonist. Wilder was 28 years older, a New Yorker with political experience. Johnson was a Midwesterner from a prominent formerly Confederate family who never had enough money to keep the Platonist going until he inherited his father's estate, after which he didn't have the time. An attorney, Johnson was never able to make a living as a writer or editor, though he did twice become mayor of his small town. Wilder was not only a published author, but also an editor of the Evening Post and of many books. Johnson lived happily with his wife and children. Wilder never had children. They drifted apart as Johnson became a leader in the Hermetic Brotherhood of Luxor. 
Born near Syracuse, New York in 1823 to a family that left Lancaster, England in 1638 to settle in Massachusetts Bay Colony, Wilder grew up on a farm. After two years of studying the works of Swedenborg and Mesmer, in the winter of 1842, 18-year-old Wilder joined the Calvinist Perfectionist, or Oneida, community, where he lived in the house of John Noyce, the founder. Members believed that the return of Jesus was not imminent because it had already happened. Therefore, a life of perfection was possible. The world had been waiting 1,800 years for someone to notice that heaven is now. What did Wilder think of noise? In an affidavit, Wilder testified, quote, I know him to be a despot, an ambitious self-seeker, and my horror of him is as intense as my horror of a venomous serpent, unquote. Having spent his youth under the domination of strict religious beliefs and practices, Wilder became a champion of syncretism. Wilder failed at teaching, farming, and typesetting. Next, he became a lumberjack. While cutting down a 50-foot tree, he felt pushed as he heard a voice that may not have been in his mind command, step back. Those eight steps saved him from being crushed. After that, he devoted himself to studying the metaphysical, but he also began reading medicine with local doctors. After a series of short-lived editorial jobs in 1857, he moved to New York City to become an editor at the Evening Post, where he stayed for 13 years. After the Civil War, the United States needed doctors. Local leaders proposed an eclectic medical college for New York City. They asked Wilder to write the charter. His reputation for integrity helped him overcome the opposition of the powerful medical establishment. When the college opened, Wilder reluctantly served as a professor. Eclectic medicine was botanically and psychologically based. As for the competition, Wilder wrote, quote, medical colleges were rare except those of the dominant school, and these would graduate nobody except with the assurance that he would adhere to the approved practice. Physicians at this time were often illiterate. Physiology was almost an unknown science. Materia medica limited to brief dimensions, and practice consisted of bleeding, the administration of calomel, antimony, and little else, unquote. Even though Wilder refused to campaign for the office, in 1871, he was elected New York City councilman in a landslide on a ticket promising to end the corruption of the notorious boss Tweed. Wilder soon learned the new boss was just as corrupt as the old. He never held office again. In 1872, he became an editor at another popular magazine, Harper's Weekly. Enter Helena Blavatsky, book first. Wilder writes, quote, on a pleasant afternoon in early autumn, I was alone in the house. The bell was rung and I answered at the door. Colonel Henry S. Alcott was there with an errand to myself. He had been referred to me by Mr. Boughton, unquote. Wilder worked for J.W. Boughton as an editor, proofreader for English and Hebrew, and expert on esoteric subjects. After Boughton bought the copyright for Isis Unveiled, he refused to return it. Blavatsky wanted to give her book the title, A Skeleton Key to Mysterious Gates. The mystery of why a book that has so little to do with Egypt should be called Isis Unveiled is solved by Wilder. Quote, Mr. Boughton is entitled to that distinction. He was a skillful caterer in the bookselling world to which he belonged, but he had business ability rather than a sense of fitness. This work of Madame Blavatsky is largely based upon the hypothesis of a prehistoric period of the Aryan people in India. And in such a period, the veil or the unveiling of Isis can hardly be said to constitute any part. In 1878, Boughton had committed another publishing gaffe. He released only volume one of the two volume obscurity, Anacalypsis, an attempt to draw aside the veil of the Saitic Isis or an inquiry into the origin of languages, nations, and religions by Godfrey Higgins, which had been published in the UK in 19, 1836. Perhaps Boughton never published the second volume because readers didn't appreciate the way he shrank the size of such a word-stuffed tome, leaving them squinting a tiny print. With both Veil and Isis in its subtitle, 
Anna Calypso seems to have been a possible inspiration for Boughton's christening of Blavatsky's book as Isis Unveiled. Also, the title gave him a chance to adorn the spine of the two volumes with a revealing illustration. What was Wilder's first reaction to Isis Unveiled? Quote, it was truly a ponderous document, unquote. But Wilder was impressed. In his report, he wrote that, quote, the manuscript was the product of great research and that so far as related to current thinking, there was a revolution in it. But I added that I deemed it too long for remunerative publishing. Boughton told Wilder to cut away as much as he could. Wilder was uncomfortable about that, but the results pleased Blavatsky. Quote, at my first visit, her reception was courteous and even friendly. We seemed to become acquainted at once. She spoke of the abridgments, which I had made of her manuscript, extolling what I had done far beyond what it deserved. What had been taken out was, quote, flapdoodle, unquote, unquote. Lavosky later wrote of Isis Unveiled, quote, next to Colonel Alcott, it is Professor Wilder who did the most for me. It is he who made the excellent index, who corrected the Greek, Latin, and Hebrew words, suggested quotations, and wrote the greater part of the introduction before the veil. If this was not acknowledged in the work, the fault is not mine, but because it was Dr. Wilder's express wish that his name should not appear except in footnotes. I have never made a secret of it, and every one of my numerous acquaintances in New York knew it." Unquote. It took some time for Alcott to arrange that first visit. Quote, Colonel Alcott was very desirous that I should become acquainted with Madame Blavatsky. He appeared to hold her in high regard, closely approaching to veneration, and to consider the opportunity to know her a rare favor for anyone. I was hardly able to share his enthusiasm. Having a natural diffidence about making new acquaintances and acting as a critic upon her manuscript, I hesitated for a long time. Finally, however, these considerations were passed over and I accompanied him to their establishment in 47th Street. The study in which Madame Blavatsky lived and worked was arranged after a quaint and very primitive manner. It was a large front room and being on the side next to the street was well lighted. It, in the midst of this was her quote unquote den, a spot fenced off on three sides by temporary partitions writing desk and shelves for books. She had it as convenient as it was unique. She had but to reach out an arm to get a book, paper, or other article that she might desire." Unquote. Wilder lists only a few of the books, among them Yacolio's work on India, Bunsen's Egypt, Enemoser's History of Magic. The place could not accord with a vivid sense of beauty, he continued, except after the ancient Greek conception that beauty is fitness for its purpose, everything certainly being convenient and handy. In this place, Madame Blavatsky reigned supreme, gave her orders, issued her judgments, conducted her correspondence, received her visitors, and produced the manuscript of her book. And what did Wilder think of Blavatsky herself? Quote, she did not resemble in manner or figure what I had been led to expect. She was tall, but not strapping. Her countenance bore the marks and exhibited the characteristics of one who had seen much, thought much, traveled much, and experienced much. Her appearance was certainly impressive, but in no respect was she coarse, awkward, or ill-bred. On the other hand, she exhibited culture, familiarity with the manners of the most courtly society, and genuine courtesy itself. She expressed her opinions with boldness and decision, but not obtrusively. It was easy to perceive that she had not been kept within the circumscribed limitations of a common female education. She knew a vast variety of topics and could discourse freely upon them." Unquote. Blavatsky made Wilder a vice president of the Theosophical Society, but the title was more honorary than active. In a letter from 1877, Wilder wrote that, quote, Blavatsky professes to be a Platonist and assures me that I am one. Unquote. The recipient of Wilder's letter, the aforementioned Thomas Moore Johnson, would publish The Platonist four years later. Wilder also wrote to Johnson that year, quote, they flattered me very much, almost grossly, and initiated me into their theosophic society. I learned 
no secret, no occult truth, nor anything which I cared to know, and declined absolutely all public identification with them, unquote. But what did Alcott think of Wilder? Quote, Professor Alexander Wilder, a quaint personality, the type of the very large class of self-educated American yeomanry, men of the forceful quality of the Puritan fathers, men of brain and thought, intensely independent, very versatile, very honest, very plucky and patriotic. He's not a college bred or a city bred man, I fancy, but if one wants sound ideas upon the migration of races and symbols, the esoteric meaning of Greek philosophy, the value of Hebrew or Greek texts, or the merits and demerits of various schools of medicine, he can give them as well as the most finished graduate. A tall, lank man of the Lincoln type, with a noble dome-like head, thin jaws, gray hair, and language filled with quaint Saxon Americanisms. He used to come and talk by the hour with HPB, often lying recumbent on the sofa with, as she used to say, one long leg resting on the chandelier, the other on the mantelpiece. And she, as stout as he was thin, as voluble as he was sententious and epigrammatic, smoking innumerable cigarettes and brilliantly sustaining her share of the conversation. The hours would slip by without notice until he sometimes found himself too late for the last train to Newark and would have to stop in town all night. I think that of all our visitors, he cared about the least of all for HPB's psychical phenomena. He believed in their scientific possibility and did not doubt her possession of them, but philosophy was his idol and the wonders of mediumship and adeptship interested him only in the abstract." Unquote. Wilder revealed the challenges Blavatsky faced as a female author when he wrote, quote, after the work had been printed and placed on sale, there was discussion in regard to the actual authorship. Many were unwilling to acknowledge that Madame Blavatsky could be sufficiently well informed or intellectually capable of such a production. The manuscript which I handled, I am very sure, was in the handwriting of Madame Blavatsky herself. Anybody who is familiar with her would, upon reading the first volume of Isis Unveiled, not have any difficulty in recognizing her as the author." Unquote. In 1882, Wilder wrote to Johnson about the Theosophist, quote, they profess to work taumaturgic wonders, to have the power of prolonging physical life, to become a parent as a wraith or dropped in one place while the unsold body is asleep in another. Judge professes to have done this, that Madame B is not the so-called Russian of that name, but a medieval personage whose soul was seeking a new incarnation and finding her body just unsold in some skirmish in the Campagna in 1848, got into it, and so is the man-woman theosophical marvel now at Bombay, etc. Very little of this was ever communicated to me personally, but I get it at second hand from General Doubleday and other, end quote. In 1882, Wilder gave lectures at the Concord School of Philosophy. The New England transcendentalists were Buddhist, Hermetic, and Christian all at once, but they were also devoted Platonists. In an article called Death Without Pain in the Transactions of the Eclectic Medical Society of 1875, Wilder called Emerson, quote, our American Plato, unquote. Emerson wrote, quote, I think one would grow handsome who read Proclus much and well, unquote. Thoreau's translation of an ancient Greek Orphic hymn to Zeus found among the Orphic fragments in his notebook is a revision of Orphic verses translated by the Cambridge Platonist Cudworth, who thought Proclus had composed them. Emerson and Thoreau were not as ardent Platonists as Bronson Alcott, the third of the great transcendentalist trinity, whom Emerson credited with being able to make the vaguest Platonic concept seem solid. But Wilder was never comfortable among the Concord elite. Looking back in 1894, he wrote in a letter to Johnson that he had felt like a, quote, strange cat in a stranger garret, unquote. For the July 1907 issue of the New Hampshire Journal, The Rosicrucian Brotherhood, Wilder wrote, quote, I suppose that the Rosicrucians have existed. I doubt whether there are any now. 
all of whom I knew that pretended to be such were charlatans, unquote. Wilder and Johnson both longed for a cosmic world religion where knowledge of the self became knowledge of the divine. But Johnson searched at the crossroads of Proclus and the Golden Dawn. His ideas about sacred sexual rituals producing superior offspring must have reminded Wilder of the eugenics practiced by John Noyce. Except for a brief, unhappy marriage, Wilder had been a lifelong bachelor. The letters of Wilder to Johnson culminate in the melancholy of a cultural twilight. They began with grand plans for journals, books, and societies, but they end in long silences and Wilder's critical comments about the fraudulent acts of leaders of the Theosophical Society and the Hermetic Brotherhood of Luxor, among others. In 1908, his 85th and final year, Wilder wrote, quote, how curious. The Plato Club is not merely broken, but non-existent. But so things go, unquote. Nine days after Wilder's death, Ford made the first Model T. Bonnie, thank, thank you so much. Shall we give Ronnie a round of applause for the Thank you.